back in the late 90s, and he was, I mean, I, some of you aren't in a, in a world where you remember how hard it was to make technology work, Microsoft was driving to drive Netscape off the market, and on and on, and, and there was no books on how to do anything, and Darren created a, a, an online school in Saskatchewan and Saskatoon, and like a lot of guys that started back then, he's not a computer scientist, he's an artist. And you can go to his website, he's a very good artist, he sells his paintings, so no pressure. But, um, <laughs> and he's uh, he's a volleyball coach and has started an elite coaching academy. So, like a lot of guys that got into the computer field back then, they were interested in a lot of different things. Not unlike, I would suggest, what we heard this morning in the keynote. So, uh, I have a lot of respect for him. Over that time, I saw him do some really cool things. And, um, I, I think that journey is worth talking about. And that's one of the things he's going to do today. So, okay. Dr. Jeremy Pinnell. That doctor. My wife always tells me I have to tell everybody I'm a doctor because she pays for it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the thing that I've been asked to talk about is uh, how I ended up, first off, as a phys ed teacher who taught art um, as an online learner. And then what process I went through in order to get there, and how I um, ended up with my doctor, and how I ended up creating what we thought at the time was a very good online high school, and how big it grew, and how popular it was. So, the way I fell into it, and it was one of those things. Art I fell into. I paint. I just painted because when I was younger, I was really anxious all the time, and so I doodled. And I doodled all the time, and I used painting as a method of calming myself down and centering myself. And so I got good at it. And uh, the school division knew after about teaching for 14 years or so, the school division knew I was an artist because I was selling my artwork and asked me if I would teach art. Which, if you ever get the opportunity, best job on the planet because every student wants to be there. And if they don't, I say, go oh, play. Take something you want to do. And so for me, that was the best thing on the planet. But three years before I started the online school, I applied to do to create an online art gallery in Saskatchewan to sell my artwork because I'm not comfortable showing. Like I won't put a whole pile of my art up on the wall and say, take a look. I'm very uncomfortable doing that. And so what I wanted to do was try to sell my artwork through the internet. So I applied for a grant, got a grant. And so, okay, now I'm going to build an online school. And you'll notice this theme runs through the whole thing. I didn't know how to make web pages. So when I got the grant, this was in 1995. There was no YouTuber or anything out there to help me to make web pages. So what I did is I took web pages, looked at the script, took a piece off, fired it up, and said, well, that's what that does. Put it back in, put, take the next piece off. And so that's how I taught myself how to do web pages. Now, as the story goes, I'm teaching, like everybody else with an overhead projector, for those young people in here, that's that thing that projects up on the wall. And I had all my lessons on that. The ball burned out on my projector. I went down to the library, and this was in Saskatoon, which was very strange. I couldn't get another ball for three weeks because they're on back order. Here I have a binder with all my overhead lessons on it. I have no ball in order to project them. So I thought, I know how to make web pages. I figured out how to do that. So then I put all my stuff onto a web page. So I did my grade 9, my grade 10 art class, my grade 11 art class. The kids came in and I said, go into the lab, because we had a lab attached to the art group. Go into the lab, write down the notes that are on the web page. After three days of doing this, some very intelligent grade 11 student said, is that going to be on the web page forever? And I go, yeah. Why am I writing it down then? <laughs> which was a very good question, which I said, well, don't then. Let's just talk about it. <coughs> then they said, why don't you put our assignments on there? Because then you don't have to stand in front of us and talk to us all the time. Which I said, fine. So I put the assignments on there. The day before the test, one of the students said, could you put a test on there so we can see what the test is going to be like, so we can have a practice test and we can try it home. So I did that. Then I had a phone call from the superintendent. We hear you're teaching online. Would you be willing to explore that for the division? <laughs> to which I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm a phys ed teacher and I, have a, I teach art. I said, I don't know how to anything about computers. 
other than making web pages. And they said, we'll give you half a year off to travel around and do a proposal as to whether you can do it in other subjects. So I sent the proposal in asking for three of the best teachers in science, math, and English, and myself. I want full-time release. I want them to have half-time half -time release. I want them all to have big computers, two screens on it, and I need half a year in order to write this and get it started. Added it in. The school division came back and said, are you kidding us? That's way too much money to get this started, and it fell flat, which was okay with me because I went back to my art room, which I love. The story goes that someone from the Board of Education went in and said, we're going to start a cyber school in two years, so we're really happy you guys aren't running one. So don't do one, save it, and you guys can work with us. The superintendent that he was talking to was the kind of superintendent that says, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> and he came to me the next day, and this was the day before Christmas, and said, we're starting the cyber school, you can have everything you asked for. By the way, you're moving schools. Now, all the students had left. The school where I taught art, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to anybody. I moved to another school, and right after the new year, we started with three of us sitting in a room with everything we needed all ready to go, and that's the way the cyber school started. Oops. As I sat down in that room with these three other teachers, two of them knew nothing about computers. I knew how to make web pages. The other guy was a math teacher and knew how to do Flash. That was our group. And they all turned to me and said, so how are we going to do this? And I turned to them and said, I have no idea. <laughs> and then that's the way the cyber school began. There was a huge number of failures because this was in 1999. Because there was no one we could compare to at the time. We did after we got started, got to share our information with other people, and they shared it with us, and so I asked a lot of questions. But I started to build a community online of people who were in the same situation I was, not knowing what they were doing or knew what they were doing, it could help you out. Next one, please, sir. So, this is the way I always do my presentations. Take a second, read through those. And somebody tell me which one you'd like to hear about. Sex and ugly students. <laughs> okay? Sex and ugly students. Let's start with that one. Read this line. <laughs> when I do these presentations, one of the things that I try not to do is I'm not going to talk to you about things that you're not interested in. And for some reason, this one, I put it on just because it's always interesting to see that it's the first one that's always chosen when I do these presentations. The second thing is this was a blog post. That this document with the 600 pages is from my blog. I started a blog in 2003 and I'm still blogging in that about the Lead Academy. Every single day, I posted something in my blog, and it was my method of communicating with my teachers and with the rest of the world when it came to what I was doing. This was something I posted just as a response to a study that was done about uh, unattractive, how attractive students are asked more questions than other ones or something along that lines. I posted this a week after I posted it. Someone from India called me and said, we'd like to ask you about your article, <laughs> which I had no idea what they are talking about. This was just a blog post that I did at 3 o'clock in the morning. And it ended up, it was on the front page of the paper, in ink, the English paper in India. And so they asked me what I thought about that. My actual statement was, we don't use videos and we treat everybody exactly the same, whether they're good looking or not good looking when they're online. The other thing that came out of that, and I tell this story all the time, I had, when I was teaching the information processing class, which was the first class I created, I called the parents and said, I'm having a real problem with your daughter. She's not logging on often enough. She's not getting her work done. Can you help me with that? To which, pause, I don't have a daughter. <laughs> and I went, is this such and such a household? And she said, yes. 
And I said, well, who is? And then that was one of those names like Pat. It was a male, not a female. So as well as ugly, gender has nothing to do with it either. <laughs> it was a total equalizer. It was my mistake because I didn't go through the registration form to find out who I was calling. All I did was look up the mother and called the mother, and I should have looked. But great equalizer. Online learning, great equalizer. When I was in high school, I would have done so much better. In high school, 65 students, 65% approximately, 70. By the time I got to grade 12, went to university in Ontario, got my university degree in Ontario, got two phys ed degrees because that's what I like doing. Got my education degree, got hired in Saskatchewan, moved to Saskatchewan. When I got involved in this and started with the three people sitting around the desk, I decided I should get educated somehow in online learning. So I did my master's here in Alberta at Athabasca. And then I got my PhD down out of Phoenix online in a mentoring system for online learning. When I got into the online learning environments, first thing in the morning, I can't make coffee. Two o'clock in the morning, I can conquer the world. I own it. My wife is a morning person. <laughs> we see each other in passing. When I was working at the cyber school, I never went to school until noon. And I left at 3 o'clock. Then I went home, did my family stuff, and I started work again when they went to bed. Because that's when the internet was fast back then. 3 o'clock in the morning, I went to bed, and then we started over again. So that was my day for 14 years <laughs> in the cyber school. What I found out is that online, when I'm not sitting in amongst a whole pile of people, and I don't have that, I got a doodle to calm myself down. I'm actually intelligent. <laughs> so my PhD, I did very well because I could research the material, I could think it through, I could take my time, I could put as much effort into it as I needed in order to be successful. So as I was taking this stuff online, a lot of the things that I found out about myself, I applied to our cyber school. So, Oh, hang on. Next. Which one? Cheating online. Oh, cheating online. <coughs> when I was given the first three teachers, they were the best teachers in this one school. After that, I was given four new teachers every single year. I walked around to each one of the schools and I got to choose my teachers. Which, if you're a principal in a building and you saw Darren, the cyber school principal, walk in, you started to sweat because you knew I was going to steal the best teacher you have in your school. The first three teachers that we chose were all in their 16th or 17th year of teaching. That was super important in cyber school. If you're going to build a cyber school, those teachers didn't come to me full time. They had a reputation in a school that when someone asked them about the cyber school, they were respected already. That was something that we made sure we did, and it was done by the superintendent, not by me, so I can't take credit for it. So then after that, when I picked new teachers, I picked the ones from the school, another school, a separate school than the one we were actually running the cyber school, and said, would you like to teach this subject? And I'm choosing you because you're in your 16th, 17th year of teaching, and you're the most respected person in your building, so that when that person talked about our cyber school, they carried some weight. And so that's how we chose them. The cheating online thing that I found very interesting. What subject did you use? English. Okay. He was an English teacher, and I walked in and I asked you, because you're an English teacher, you're the best English teacher in the world, and I'd like you to teach at my cyber school. I could sell that to you. You, I could ask, what do you think about kids taking cyber school? The first thing that came out of most people's mouth was any subject but English. English can't be taught online. That would come from him, social studies teacher. What do you think of cyber school? Same thing. Everything but social studies. Christian ethics. Christian ethics, I was in the Catholic school division. Christian ethics was the foundation. There's no way, and this was from the board office, there's no way that should be taught online because it's the foundation. Every kid in the school should learn the Christian ethics and should do it online face to face. Here's a question for you. In this environment, and this happens in Christian ethics all the time, what do you think of God? Don't answer that. 
Okay? So if I'm asking him, how comfortable do you think he is telling you about God and amongst all these people? As a Christian ethics teacher, which my wife is, she was very comfortable doing it. When kids in my art class said, Mr. Cannell, what do you think of God? Or even myself as an adult, I would be uncomfortable saying that. This allowed you to do it. Okay, so that's the exciting thing, is that because it's one-on-one -on -one a lot of times, and you're not in a cohort, you don't have to say things in front of people. And for a lot of kids, that was super important. To get back to this, this is a study that I did with the kids. I asked them directly. One of the things that in my third year or second year of doing the cyber school, we right away started to poll the kids all the time. When they registered, they had to do a separate poll. When they finished their first report card, 75 days. So that was a second response back then. When the research came out, this research, I never quoted it to anybody in the face-to-face -face schools because it wasn't important. Students, no matter what happens, and depending on how you design it, if you ask everybody exactly the same question, when did Columbus discover America? Okay, Everybody would know the answer, so you know the answer. Ask her, when did it so Then you would answer the question you got from her. Is that cheating? No. We had to reevaluate what we thought was cheating. We had to ask the question, when did Columbus discover America? How did that affect you in your life right now? That's a totally different question than getting somebody to quote a fact back. And so that's the way we structured a lot of our stuff. No final exams. No textbooks. Textbooks automatically went to read this material. Here's the questions. Give us the answers. That's not what we want. We want to change the way the school was approached. So the biggest mistake we made at the very beginning is hiring 17-year-old, 17-year teachers. The second biggest mistake we made, uh, the best thing we ever did, was hire 17-year teachers. Now, the worst thing about it was that they had spent 17 years in the classroom being the sage on the stage. You know how hard that is to beat out of some teachers so that they understand that they don't have to be the center all the time? That these two can talk to each other and come up with an answer just as effectively as you asking me rather than him. And in the classroom, you'd say, shh, quit talking to each other. Do it yourself. If you need some help, I'll help you. And the same result. Parents all of a sudden were really involved in the kids' online education. They would be sitting beside them. Now, we drew the line when they were doing tests for them and stuff like that. And that became a lot of my job later on is when we caught the people cheating online. But cheating changed. And I think you said that this morning a lot. Cheating is not the same thing. If you were asked to write an essay about how Columbus affected your life, if your mom sat down beside you and wrote an essay with you, it would be of a higher quality. When you sent it in, if you were a 52% student approximately, we would say, geez, this doesn't look like she did it herself. So then we asked the question, who helped you? Well, my mom did. Did you do most of the work? Did you learn anything from it? Yes, what did you learn? Well, this is what I did. And then that's a great thing. It would be no different than you asking me for help with it, and her essay would still get better as well. So, we changed what cheating was all about. Did I answer the question? Yes, sir. Good. <clears throat> Why am I not going home? Because I messed up. <laughs> That's the home button. Hang on, let's just go back. There we go. There we go. There you go. There's an app for that. <laughs> What's next, you guys? Be sacred, be sacred. The synchronous removed the flexibility. The word flexibility was something that as the administrator and as the person that developed it, I wanted it to be as flexible as you possibly can because it was designed to help the students who were in our face-to-face -face classrooms in our, within our division. So our aim was to have about 180 students. We crossed that threshold in the first two months. By the time we hit six months in, we were at 600 students from our own division. And so the synchronous model wouldn't have allowed us to do that. The other thing that happens is that asynchronous for me allowed us to think about the future where we would now remove distance, which means time wasn't important. We did a I did a proposal 10 or 11 years ago that we should start 
taking our courses over to China. They have just now done it. And so two months ago or whatever, they flew all over to China, and now the classes are all being offered in China in this Irish school that I was involved with. That doesn't work unless you have this. <laughs> this was the most successful. We had a rural school that couldn't teach physics. They didn't have a physics teacher. I had the best physics teacher in the province in the cyber school. He offered to teach the whole grade 12 class physics. Every single student had to take it. It was an elective, but every single student in that school was told, you're taking this. If we're going to have this teacher come in and do this, you're going to have to do it. They put another teacher at that end as well. So there was my teacher who was running the asynchronous online stuff and ran some synchronous stuff with them at the same time and was there as help and contact expert. And then the teacher on the, their end, where all the students were, kicked them to keep them on task. It was the most successful course we ever offered. All those kids were forced to take it. Every single one of them passed it. And the average was about 85 or 86. And that's off the top of my head, so I might be wrong a little bit. So this is awesome. And you build capacity on the ground. So you maybe do that a couple of years, and that teacher <coughs> Totally correct. And they paid us, which was super important because of that. It brought in some money into this school division that we were now getting bigger and bigger all the time. When I actually finished, we had, I'm just quoting numbers off my head, so I might be wrong, but we had 47 teachers and they were scattered all throughout the division. And so it was a real experiment of things that worked and things that didn't work. When we started with the three teachers in that back room, the back of the art room, we <laughs> paid for their computer at home, so a laptop, we paid for their high-speed connection at home, and the moment the school got up to about 16 teachers, suddenly it was too expensive, yeah. and they canceled it. They took away the stuff and said, no, we can't afford to do that, because what about these other teachers that are teaching face-to-face, -face? They're all, they all want to have high-speed at home too. I said, well, these people aren't teaching anyplace else. And so, uh, there were some, some issues that came with that. The teachers that I had, just for a second, just to interrupt, maybe put that in mind in terms of cost, because people get ice speed pretty cheap. But high speed internet back then was probably what? Hundreds of dollars a month, right? Oh yeah, easy. Oh, maybe. Yeah, it was, it was a big expense, but at the time, the internet in the school was awful. And so you could come to the, the pod, and we call it the pod, the room that we, the four of us were sitting in, and the pod changed three or four times during my career. But the first one was a, a room about the size of this table. And the four of us sat there with our everything all squashed together in the middle. And during the day, we talked because the internet didn't work. <laughs> we couldn't get on the same, we couldn't get to the server that was downtown fast enough to do any work. So we talked about what we were going to do, and then everybody went home and worked from home. And so that was great. When you got up to one time, we had 32 teachers all in the same room, all trying to access the cyber school at the same time. That became the big party central you've ever seen in your life because the internet was so slow, so there was lots of talking. But talk about an exciting environment to live in. And he, as an administrator, sat right in the middle of them. I didn't have my own office or anything like that. Well, we talked about everything. I swear I heard the whole um, Monty Python's <laughs> quotation, the one English teacher knew the whole thing by heart, and he quoted that off all the time, and we had the math teacher over here who was helping somebody over here with making flashcards. That incubator system was so important for us to be successful, to have all that conversation. But on top of that, piles of work, piles of work. A 100-hour course would be ready to go. We gave 200 hours of release time to write a 100-hour course. It normally took between 400 and 600 hours to get it to the point where I would approve it to put it online and allow students to see it. And then it was never finished. We burnt out so many teachers by continually giving you a change. So if you're working for me, have you got any videos in your course? No. You want to learn how to do videos? No. Well, you're going to. <laughs> and that went on continuously where the courses were always developed and were never finished. But it was also the first time in my teaching career where I had the whole course right there, right from start to finish. But I was, should be saying on the first day and the second day. Now, to go back to that statement that I said about the 17-year 17, 17 teacher who was the biggest problem, when they taught online, I mean, face-to-face, -face, 
That's the way we started building our cyber school. Big mistake. But we had to start somewhere. So I asked the question, what do you do on your first day? Hey, digitize that. Get that online. What did you do on your second day in your class? Digitize that. Get that online. And so that's the way we wrote, wrote our first courses. They have to be different. It's not face to face. You can do so much more. It can be so much more exciting. And so that's where we got to in fact. So oh, just next. takes you back one. There we go. Class size and teacher utilization. <laughs> 14 years I worked at the cyber school. I retired at the very end because I had been doing my doctorate for six years and my marriage was going to fall apart if I had to do it for another year. So I retired and finished my doctorate. During those 14 years, this was one of the biggest fights we ever had with the school division. Our original <laughs> class size was 20. That's where we started at. When I left, it was 30. It takes an hour and a half just to communicate in a asynchronous online course. The amount of communication that happened was about an hour and a half of work. We gave you one hour to teach it. All my teachers, except for the ones that were assigned to me because of health reasons and other reasons, worked in a face-to-face -face school as well. They were given a release time for one of their sections, or whatever you guys blocks as you guys call them, I think. They were given one of those release time, and they taught three times, three hours in that school, and then one online, and they could go home and do that wherever. If it takes an hour and a half just to respond to the students' requests and their questions, then you've got a problem. We also introduced the 150-day schedule. We eliminated the semester system, which was the second fight I got in, which was a big one. Really increased the number of students you have in your course. If you go semester system, and you can only start at the end, at the beginning of the semester, that means you're gonna have some students who may drop out or finish early or decide not to take the course or something like that. So some teachers who started when we were in the semester system would get halfway through the semester and they would have, like I said, we started with 20, they would have 10 kids left in their class because the dropout rate was high because it wasn't a video game and the kids thought it would be a video game and so much easier to do. A lot of the students that came to us came from our face-to-face -face schools and were not successful in the face-to-face -face schools and so why do you think you're going to be successful online if you're not going to put any effort into it? It was more work. We covered 150 hours of material. There are some schools who don't have 150 hours of instructional time. In cyber school, you finished the whole course. You didn't have the option to not do some of it. Or in a face-to-face -face school, you have all sorts of other stuff going on, and sometimes you don't finish the curriculum, and you don't get through everything. Not here. It became a lot more work. Okay. <coughs> sure, I'll come up with something else, but we'll come back to it. Okay, did that answer the question? Well, and back in the day, a lot of talk happened about how you pay for the courses. Right. So we were never CEU funded, we were butts and seats September 30th. So if Aaron's going to teach one of my kids through the online school in favor, I work with him. And so they came up with a lot of different programs, but, but we found delivery it was at least a two-to-one. So if the teacher was teaching an online course for a, for a block, they got prep for a block. <laughs> and once that started to erode, when we went teaching, right. it's a big job. It was, it was very difficult. It was also, um, there's a lot of money involved with that. Credit recovery became a big money maker for us. In uh, four years that we actually took stats on it, um, we made thirteen thousand dollars in four years with the cyber school. That's over and above everything else. Really, we did. Really. Sorry, what did I say? Um, sorry, thirteen million dollars. Um, you shouldn't. You wouldn't believe how much my position changed when they found out how much money we were actually making at the cyber school. For the first five to seven years, I had a really good superintendent, but wasn't technologically literate. And so when I started to talk about, hey, we're not going to run asynchronous, we're going to run videos, we want to do it this way, da, 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 da. So then I stopped asking. And he had faith in my abilities to move this forward, and I moved forward. And that's why I said there was a lot of things that when we started to say, okay, we're going to put 20 kids in a class. Well, three years after we did it, suddenly we had a superintendent who's going, you can't have 20 kids in a class. No one else in the division has 20 kids in the class. You can't do that. 
said, well, look, it takes an hour and a half for them to get through 20 kids in the class or 30 kids in the class. Well, we think you should be doing this. And then we talked about the 150-day schedule where the kids are coming in and there was a waiting list for every single course all the time. So if you graduated a, class, a kid today, 10 minutes after that kid graduated, you sent in the final mark to the office, another student went in your class. And then we were teaching like 48, 50, 55 kids in a semester. Some of them didn't finish, some of them finished faster. The 150 days was a suggested schedule on how long they have to complete it, but it doesn't take 150 days. So suddenly we had all these kids that were going in and we started making money. So then that became a great bargaining chip for me. Hey, can I ask you a question? Of course. So you complete student A and you're going to populate that spot with the student from the waiting list. Correct. What would be the latest you would put that student A in the school year? We had a student who came in and had five credit courses. Okay. Yeah. For a five credit course. We never let anyone come in for a, a five, like each one of your courses were five credit. Well, the course, course would be course, yes. Yeah. Okay. Course, course, we, course, we, course. Like my philosophy is no one should take everything online. Like that's wrong in my mind. And so we never had anybody, we had people who came in, like everybody in our system was allowed to take one credit first. And then if you proved you were successful, we'd put you in possibly for two at the maximum number. The reason why that's important is that because you can work at your own speed, I can put you in five credits. But how is that different than you starting on one credit and every night putting eight hours into that credit and finishing it in two weeks? And then start another credit. In one semester, you'll still complete five credits. Let's say that the science theory is a five credit course. Okay. What would be the latest in the school year that you would allow them to We had someone come in two weeks before and finish. She lived it, but she wanted to get into nursing. And she needed the chemistry class. So that was the fastest one we went through. We also didn't kick kids out. So you would come in. We shut down the school, <laughs> server shut down on this date, we'll start it up again September 1. <laughs> and then guess where you are in the course? Get going. <laughs> and then they started where they finished off. And so the whole art artificial restrictions that we put on, this is the end of school, we can't have anybody carry on, we removed it. We started summer school. And in the summer school, we started credit recovery and we tried to fill in all those gaps, which are artificial things. The 21 years of age, Restriction that we had in Saskatchewan, who came up with 21 years of age? Why wouldn't you let a 35 year old come in and take this course if you can then go into nursing and become a nurse and pay more tax and all this stuff? Doesn't that make sense? Do you think I could find anybody that would allow me to put somebody in over 21 years of age? You know what the question, the statement was? No, community colleges look after the older kids. That's where all the funding goes. Great. Community college was so overtaxed, they were sending all their kids to me. Where'd you come from? The community college down the street. Well, I'm not allowed to teach you, you're 22. They sent me. <laughs> and so those are the arguments that I have that we get. There's a lot of restrictions in our education system, curriculums and all sorts of other things that make education so difficult for us as teachers. And so for 14 years, I fought. I was so tired at the end of it because I was trying to remove as many of those restrictions as you can. The question that you just asked, when can I put one in? Two days before the end of school to make sure you have a spot. So if there's spots in it, you take the, if you want to take chemistry, great. You can't do it over the summer. We're operating it in the summer if you like to take it, but it's going to cost you money. But if you don't want to take it in the summer, fine. We'll put you in. September 1, you can start again, but you've got a spot. Otherwise, you might be in a wait list. So then you had a whole list of kids that were ready to go. And so a lot of them printed off the course. And then when they came in on September 1, one test, second test, third test, there's a sign of three, four, five, and it's all home <laughs> there you go. And that was their version of doing summer school. Totally flexible. Were we against that? No. Just as long as it was their work and they were legit. And I questioned so many kids on that type of thing. The best one I ever did. Had a student write a test the same time he was playing floor hockey down in the gym. So it wasn't him. Came then. I figured that out on my own. <laughs> His mother worked at SAS Tel. He didn't understand the amount of tracking that you have in cyber school. So we tracked it. It came from SAS Tel. It was a Christian ethics assignment, and one of the questions was <laughs> Who do you think is the hero in your life? My mother is the hero in my life. 
To which I went to the school that he was at, and I said, come here, out of the phys ed class. I said, who's your hero? Wayne Gretzky. Ooh. Ten minutes ago, it was your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the things that, as teachers, in your face-to-face -face classrooms, how many times have you had that gut instinct that something's not right? The same thing happens when you're taught online for long enough. You get that gut instinct that this person can't speak English when I talk to them, yet writes a third-year university-level essay. Failed English in the face-to-face -face school every year up until this point. Now that she's got a 92. That's a play. <laughs> and so you get better at that, and the teachers got better at it. Me as an administrator did the same thing. Okay. Sorry. What's your constant context on course ownership? <laughs> Universities. Um, this is where this all all started. When a teacher sat down, there was a few teachers that really wanted to get into cyber school. They wrote courses for their face-to-face -face classes using Moodle at the time, and that was the the. Uh, LMS were using, they would write, let's say it's a photography class, they would write the photography class and then they would come to us and say, I will give you my photography class if I could teach in a cyber school. So it was their way of getting into the cyber school because Darren didn't know who the heck he was and then go and ask him to come be a cyber school teacher. And so it's great, great idea. You just saved us a whole pile of money by writing this. Can we have the course? No, it's fine. Then the discussion started. Who owns the course? At the university level, if you write a university course, it's yours. The court case that was going on at that time, someone was fired and wiped his course off the server before the university could get his hands on it. So the university took him to court, and there's all sorts of fighting going on back and forth. So I brought this up with the administration or school division. I said, okay, who owns the course? We settled on the fact. Is it even on there? Yeah. We both owned it. With the transient nature of teachers these days, if they went to another school division, they could take the course with them. One of the things that we did at the very beginning of the cyber school is gave everything away. If you wanted our courses, here you go. I don't believe the strength is in the content. The strength is in the approach and the people you have teaching it. The teachers are still the most important element in any course that's ever being taught. And online teachers, face-to-face -face teachers, don't necessarily make the best online teachers. There's some skills you have to learn. A teacher who's been in a face-to-face -face school for 17 years is hitting that point in their career where they're a little bit bored, they're a little bit tired of teaching, they need a little bit of revitalization. They're great to have in a school division, in a cyber school. So they were great. They helped me out a lot, and they transformed the way they taught in the face-to-face -face school by what they learned online. They had to take themselves off the stage, be the guide, don't be the sage. And that was such a huge problem with some teachers, and some teachers were asked to leave the cyber school because of that. That you cannot be the only resource. At the very end, we were writing courses without writing any material. Now that's when the internet got really exciting. That's when cyber school got really exciting. You don't have to write content. All you have to do is find it, connect it all together, put it out there. So, great. That's where it got really exciting. Guess what? I'm not giving you any time to prepare. It's so easy to do now. It's already all written. You don't have to write any content anymore. So, I'm not giving you a whole semester off to write it. I'll give you seven days. And I want it up and running. So every single process that we got through and got more advanced and better at it was more harmful to the teachers and we expected more from them. And that's why we worked with some teachers. But teachers are like that no matter what they're teaching. <laughs> We're all crazy in the amount of effort we put into things. I almost killed myself building <coughs> this thing. Taking a full-time cyber teaching cyber school full-time and then doing uh, my master's and then doing my online. I was a full-time student. You know how many times I got audited because I was full-time working and full-time PhD students? I got audited every single year, but I didn't sleep a lot. So, well, just just a comment from somebody working back with Darren in the day. I mean, there was a bunch of stuff we were trying to build in, in Waver, and 
Saskatchewan had a thing called Central High School where they just find a teacher for a year or two or whatever, and you write a course, and then they put it out, and it was a free kind of like, uh, you know, learn procedures and so on. Um, same problem with that as, as with you know, everyone is nobody did any evergreen. So. But in that process, uh, we reached out to Darren more than once, and they were always more than willing to share it. There was a lot of stuff going on in that one to one, but there wasn't that sort of there wasn't a big enough community provincially to collaborate like we have the potential to do here. And you can see it happening all the time, so it's still possible. Right. So I mean if you were to start right now building what you were building then, it would be a whole lot easier, right? Oh, definitely. Well, in the first year I put together, sorry, I'll make you a second. I built the Association of Online K to twelve teachers and ended up with teachers from every continent on the planet. And they were all just there asking exactly the same questions because